Thanks very much. So I, you know, I think that gets gets you going. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and now, if I may, I would uh, pass the the torch, the the word to Tarje. And um, maybe I, I should say, yeah, Tarje. <laughs> yeah, I introduce you. Tarje was uh, one of my first uh, <laughs> students in in, in Munich. And um, at the time we had already, we were playing with um, axisymmetric solutions. I showed you a picture this morning, uh, finite difference simulations on a global scale. The problem was um, uh, that allows only very specific type of sources that are not very realistic. Uh, I'm not gonna go into details, but what Tarja did when he did, started his PhD then in, in, in Princeton, is to, first of all, not use uh, finite differences, but spectral elements, so much much more accurate surface waves. And he extended that to uh, having, and that's a theoretical development together with the famous uh, Tony Dahlen, um, is to allow for arbitrary sources. And that made suddenly made this approximation really, really interesting for, let's say, high frequency simulations on a global scale. So maybe I'll leave it at, at, at that, Tarja, and uh, give the word to you. All right, thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> I'm really sorry, but I um, just ended up positive with COVID yesterday for the first time after avoiding it for two years. Um, so I hope I last. I'm, I'm feeling fine, but it's just a bit, um, yeah, scratchy. Can you yeah, see? Yeah, we hope it stays weak. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weak, but it's, it's a voice thing, I think. Can you yeah. see? Um, no, this is not the right screen. Sorry. Um, screen two. Okay. All right. So, so today I um, decided to to separate this sort of into two broad um, categories. Uh, the first of which is basically the Axisim legacy and Instasize and Syngen, and that then leads over to Axisim 3D uh, later on. So I also have to excuse Ben Fernando, <clears throat> who was supposed to teach this as well with me. And he um, is unfortunately caught up in some inside whirlwind, <laughs> so to speak, um, literally, actually. So um, yeah, he has, to, he has to do spontaneous meetings on the inside mission, Mars mission. Um, OK, so, so I wanted to start with a few uh, slides on the different levels of complexity really that we're facing when we do modeling. Yeah, here, so that's that's my COVID situation. Um, I guess at first, just a recap, unfortunately I didn't manage to, to attend yesterday and this morning. Um, just a few points that are really relevant for this kinds of, these kinds of approaches that I'll uh, show, show today. So of course, um, I mean, we know this, that waves are extremely efficient in, in, in transporting information, probably the most efficient type of physical transport. And I think we should never forget that they always carry information about both the source and the structure. When we do a seismic analysis, we often try to separate one, of, one from the other, but, but in the end, you know, you, you cannot separate them. And um, more pertinent to the um, sort of topics of today for me are the ideas and, and problems associated with multi-scale complexity. So of course the earth acts, you know, its processes act across many orders of magnitude, I think seven or eight at least that are of relevance for, for seismic motion. And within these, um, the waveforms that we observe, you know, very point-wise at the surface, they, um, they encode and, and, and sort of convolve all of this information that propagates through these multi-scale structures and uh, importantly through broadband waveforms. Um, of course, the, the basic question of seismology is just how to disentangle all of these different processes and especially at multi-scale. Now, um, I'm sure you heard enough of that from Heiner. Um, linear elastodynamics is, is an interesting system because it's very easy to set up, very easy to... Um, to sort of write down the, you know, derive the, the PDE and then, and then um, also to, to understand the, the basic process, it's just interaction of, of reflections and transmissions and diffractions essentially. But of course, it's extremely expensive to solve as you go to large space and, and multi-scale structures and high frequencies. So that in particular comes with the, um, the fact that the computational cost uh, scales in, in these sort of discrete methods with the uh, fourth power in the frequency. 
So that's simply down to the fact that you have in, in three dimensions that you have three spatial dimensions and one uh, time dimension. So as such, when you double when you double the resolution, you end up having two to the fourth power um, increase in, in computational cost as a as a sort of rule of thumb. Um, sorry, I, I, I'm sure I repeat some of this from the, this morning's lectures. I just um, couldn't attend them. Um, yeah, so so with this computational cost, um, usually come approximations or simplifying assumptions that are, um, I would say, inevitable in any case. We, we never solve the accurate problem. And that means that, that whatever you know you solve, even if it, if it contains all of the 3D complexities um, of your given physical process, you, we always neglect something that could be gravity or porosity or you know, nonlinear rheologies, as we talked about earlier, and, and just the, the, the fact of the smaller scales. So, so as soon as we, we solve something on a discrete system, we, we impose smaller scales. And, they might always be affecting the, the larger process altogether. And that leads me to really starting with this slide. Um, and that's, I guess, what any seismologist should start with. And that's what we observe. Um, and that is, is from a paper from Rose Nieder, who will be talking at the um, SPIN workshop in a few, more, few weeks. So um, here is, on top, you see an unfiltered trace. So it's really what we observe at, at a seismometer station. And then what you see below in the second and third panels are basically the um, the, the bandpass filtered uh, um, uh, traces. So what one at high resolution, one at lower resolution. And in his paper, and, and, and I mean, as you can see, one can pose the question, well, they seem to be propagating through completely different planets. And this is the sort of broadband character that I was alluding to. And I think this is very important in terms of finding you know, appropriate numerical solutions that they adapt somehow to the complexity and the scale of your interest. So here you see um, an actual axisem simulation, and we sort of differentiated the wave field into into um, compressional motion and shear motion just by applying the uh, uh, um, dot product and the curl operator. And with that, you see basically how quickly, um, by just interacting with, with spherical shell uh, interfaces, how quickly this wave field becomes very, very complex. Now, um, this is still nothing compared to wave propagation in, in truly three-dimensional media. So here, this is a really jagged video, but I've, I've done that with uh, Spectrum 2D back in the day. And uh, that's, that's a wave field that, that sort of interfaces with or interacts with a, with a salt body. So that's, of course, what, what is really relevant for the exploration scale. Now, um, the question is, you know, um, do we always need full waveforms? And if so, what part of a waveform? So even in, in the most sophisticated inverse analysis these days, people typically choose well-informed, um, you know, subsets of the data set that could be just, you know, so the, the direct body waves or just some part of the actual full waveform. And then once, you, once you've chosen sort of a time and frequency window, what, what measurement do you take? Do you take an L2 norm, just you know, separating um, one trace minus the other, or do you take some sort of equivalent travel time information, something like that? And then of course, what frequency ranges, um, how sort of your data resolution looks like. And this, I think, works for the forward problem as much as for the inverse problem. And then, and then I think fundamental to this sort of analysis here is, is how complex the background model should be. And that is actually not an easy question to answer. So I think all of this, of course, depends on exactly your problem. So I'm, I'm glad we spoke about some of the problems that you want to solve, but I'm sure this evolves over time. But in other words, this sort of leads to the um, idea that, that we're faced with uh, different levels of complexity, the different types of complexity, when choosing even, even simply um, you know, a simple solver. So I just plotted some, some typical axes here. So on the, on the top axis, you see the sort of the computational complexity and on the right axis, the geophysical and structural complexity. And just with a few examples. So, so when it comes to you know, geophysics, if we start here, um, the first question is about the 3D model. You know, do you need a crust and a topography um, and solid fluid interfaces? So it could be the core, but could also be the ocean, but could also be the atmosphere, something that we want to um, do on Mars, for example. And then, and then um, Ben, who, who unfortunately can't make it, um, he uh, simulated um, or tried to simulate the interior of the sun. And on the, on the so-called surface of the sun, we, we actually don't know the boundary condition. So these are sort of open questions. And, and, and they basically, all we know is that they dampen the wave field. So um, these are complex physics, physical questions that, that um, you know, all feed into what, what you choose as a solver. And then, of course, there's sort of the more regular seismic uh, um, um, discussion points like attenuation, anisotropy, and rupture. You know whether you need actual dynamic rupture, like Alice um, will be showing tomorrow, and then other topics like gravity. I think which is a really interesting topic, um, not only in, in the sense of sort of large, um, you know, um, mass um, displacements, but also also the more recent um, 
finding that large earthquakes have prompt gravity signals that can be measured. Um, there's a rotation of the Earth, and then of course at small scales we have porous media, and and when it comes to sort of partial melt or oceans, I think I think one has to be really careful about um, discretizing these. So of course on the algorithmic side, the question is how do you solve your PDE? What kind of discretization, if any at all? Um, the meshing is, is is an absolutely central topic that that um, I've spent a lot of time on as well, and and it's it's probably the most one of the most time consuming topics that we often sort of gl uh, gloss over. Um, I'm, I'm sure um, Alice will have a lot to tell, to tell about that tomorrow because it's a lot easier with uh, tetrahedra. Yeah, there, there are other questions like higher order time stepping, which we've done, and then local time stepping, which some other groups have done as well. And of course, um, with ever increasing computing power, one has to worry, unfortunately, about making them actually scale well on these new machines. So um, yeah, so this is a sort of, you know, easy um, direct wave um, type. And here you have multi-scale complexity with, with scattering and diffusive behavior. Now, um, how does this translate into computational costs, so to speak? So here's an example for a global wave field. And at each point in the graph, you have essentially the, the connection between the seismic period and the equivalent core numbers. So, that, so that's essentially the, the computational cost in terms of the, the um, CPU hours, so to speak, on the vertical axis. So what you see here are basically two curves. One is for three-dimensional problems and one is for, for um, two-dimensional problems. So um, it's nothing but, but sort of replicating the, the you know, um, uh, fourth power and the frequency for the three-dimensional stuff and, and third power for the two-dimensional stuff. But I think, I think for these sort of exponential um, behaviors, it's, it's actually quite, quite um, good to, to see that on the, on the graph, how, how um, extreme that becomes when you go to high resolutions. So if you, if you take, for example, 50 seconds, the cost is, is certainly doable for anything like 3D global simulations like this. Um, it's a couple of CPU hours, essentially. But as you, as you increase the frequency and the fourth power with that, you end up reaching um, um, simulation costs, which are, which are really challenging, and even on the largest machines. So at five seconds and in, for 3D solver, what you're faced with is 10 to the almost 10 to the five um, computational um, course essentially for an hour of simulation. But if you if you can allow yourself to drop down to a two-dimensional simulation, you save many orders of magnitude, two or three orders of magnitude. So, so you're back into a realm that you can actually fit on the, a workable system. And now I think Heinrich talked about the holy grail of sort of uh, you know observable um, um, seismograms at the global scale, and that's typically seen as one hertz. Although in, in some certain sort of array measurements, one can go to up to eight hertz even. Um, which maybe for spin is quite interesting for, for very specific sort of nuclear monitoring derived stations. So I've seen some data at eight hertz at uh, teleseismic distances. So point being is that once you go to one hertz and this 3D uh, problem becomes absolutely um, um, exuberant. So it's, it's up here somewhere. So it would be, I'm sorry, my, my, my mouse is on the wrong screen. Um, so it would be somewhere like 10 to the well, eight, nine uh, CPU hours for one simulation. So this is this is the reason, or part of the reason, why we ended up um, starting to look at at uh, these methods that you know are, are geared towards simpler structures because they're so much cheaper. So here, just as a summary, some of the um, sort of um, approaches in seismology at the global scale that are interesting at different resolutions. Now, um, yeah, so, so I'm just going to pose a few problems that we might be interested in, and here's a category of of sort of global scale, not even global scale stuff, but but planetary interiors, mantle structure, then um, also kinematic rupture, ocean ambient noise, landslides. Then, um, for example, what, what if you're interested in, in sort of the, the, the seismic um, scattering effect of thermochemical blobs in the mantle, or you might be interested in, in the uh, inner, inner core anisotropy. These are all topics that most of you are probably have no clue about. It's completely fine. But I'm just throwing a few very, very different problems at you. And we're going to work through them to see with what kind of complexity you can solve any of these problems. So in the third category, we have tomography, tomography model validation. So with that, we mean basically propagating waves through a tomographic model and then verifying that that fits the data that um, you know, was used to derive the tomography. And then um, what about small scale structures at the core metal boundary, for example, or anywhere else in the deep earth? The problem of seismic hazard, where of course, shaking is very much dependent on sedimentary basins and and sort of um, very, very, very strong topography, for example. So very 3D, three-dimensional effects. And then in general, more crustal effects, surface waves and so on. So 
I can, um, you know, once you've given some software hardware and people, you can translate that into different dimensionalities. And, and I'll hope to convince you during the talk today that, that, that we, can, we can solve at least a lot of all of this by, by looking at different dimensionalities. Now, um, um, a, a sort of inter intercept here, um, when, when someone says, you know, this is the perfect method or this is an accurate method, I would always be very, very careful, um, especially when you're sort of starting to use these methods, because it's it's a bit of a, a sort of a um, catch twenty two or, or sort of a curse that we all sort of um, uh, carry on with ourselves because of a lack of of a better um, expression. Accurate, um, basically, as as a freestanding word, makes absolutely no sense. I mean, it only makes sense with reference to something, just like when you say like today is temperature outside or something, or warm. You know, it's it's where are you, what season are you in, and that sort of thing. So, so um, accurate always makes sense only when you when you compare it to the cost, only when you compare it to the complexity of the problem and so on. And and when when methods have been proven to be accurate for some benchmark or some validation, for example, then what typically happens is that they've been shown to converge to the exact solution. So as you increase resolution, you you converge. But um, what what is really difficult here, and this is the grain of salt, is is as soon as you go outside of the proven parameter space, um, it's unfortunately to say generally unreliable. So you cannot say it's accurate for this problem, hence it'll be accurate for a completely different problem. And in, in our kinds of seismology codes, this comes mostly from um, how one discretizes 3D models. So a very simple example, you know, once, once something has been shown, let's say a spectral element method versus a finite difference and discontinuous Galerkin, um, maybe all of these have been shown to be very accurate for a certain setting with very complex interfaces. Let's say you take this and say like, okay, I can trust it. And you go some different place and you have to mesh the, the spectral element um, through dimensional structure, but you, you cannot quite afford to mesh, let's say a certain lens or a certain sort of sedimentary basin. The problem then is that, that once you don't mesh it accurately, then the wave field is not accurate. So in other words, it has to be really referred to, you know, the, the questions that you've asked when, when, you, when you looked at the circuits in the first place. Uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Right, so so um, just do this quickly. So so what we want to do here is basically a sequence, which is kind of the chronology of, of what we've been working on in my group and with collaborators, is um, you know coming from this axisem um, initial um, idea that that fed into um, something that that we then derived into insta size and Sunjin, and I'll talk about that later, and in three D, which which will be the second session today, is axisem three D. Now, um, I'm putting in red here Axiom 3D because the idea is that eventually Axiom 3D will sort of supersede Axiom completely. It does already at this point, and it basically incorporates the, the, the full speed up of Axiom. Um, we just haven't, you know, it's, it's a bit more difficult to code to, to manipulate than, than Axiom. So Axiom itself, the old one, is still very popular because it's very easy to install and run, and for good reasons. But in terms of functionality, this, this, new, code, this new code basically has all of this included. Okay, um, so here are just some resources, and I, I suppose I'll share these slides anyway, so you can you can click on these. Um, we have a web page. I call that influencers, because these are just some catchy videos essentially about from from wave propagation. So have a look if you Google seismology Oxford. Um, some of the people in my group put that up, and, and these are some of the simulations I'm showing here. And feel free to use them, of course. And then all these different codes of different websites, so it's Axisems, Insights, Syngen. There's also MC kernel, which stands for Monte Carlo kernel. And that's a code that um, you know, sort of started in my last chapter of the thesis, but it completely re revamped by Simon Stehler, who, who wrote this with a much more comprehensive approach with Monte Carlo integration. What this does is basically takes axis and wave fields and, 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 con and convolves them essentially to sensitivity kernels for the inverse problem. So this code is kind of functional as well, but I'm not presenting it today. Just, just in case you're interested in, in, in axisem-based sensitivity kernels and inverse problems, that, that should be um, all right too. And then axisem 3D. There are also additional practicals and, and some of them are really instructive. So I, I advise you to, to have a look. Um, InstaSize, there's a lot actually online also in Seismolive, Syngen as well. And also notably, there is an axisem local version and with that, an insercise local version. So you can construct local scale um, insercise databases. There's a tutorial on YouTube by, by um, Martin um, uh, Leon, and I think one more person, I forget, Simon, and MC Kernel. Okay, so um, what about this whole dimensionality problem? So, so here's, here's a um, iris um, 
plot of, of what we call the um, 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 travel time curve, essentially. So what you see are basically 400,000 contributing seismograms that have been stacked, so one top of each other in a very nonlinear way. And oh, on to, over the right is the distance from earthquakes over the surface of the Earth, so to the antipode at 180 degrees, and up is time. And what you see essentially is, is a very crisp alignment um, of these waves, so these are literally se seismograms, with dominant phases. So these are essentially reflecting reflections, as you see here. And as time passes, these, these become incredibly complex. So you see, you see these sort of mul multiple rever reverberations with the surface, um, you know, trans transmissions into the core and, and phases that just bounce around the, the earth multiple times up to uh, 90 minutes. So what does this say? It basically says that, that the majority of the wave field, the majority of the data that we, that we observe at the surface is close to spherical symmetry which means that, that the, um, the interfaces, core metal boundary crust and all of the ones in between are the dominant feature that contribute to the complexity or the, the nature of this wave field. And of course we have the deviations, which is what we're interested in, in tomography and, and earth dynamics and so on. But um, it's still a fact that is interesting to, to exploit. And it sort of relates a bit to these kinds of quotes um, that say, you know, don't over, over, um, over do your problem and, and just stick to the complexity. Um, that is necessary. In, in effect, as you, you might see later on if you read our papers, um, the, the opposite is actually happening compared to this quote. So the, uh, the methods that we use to make things simpler actually are more complicated mathematics, <laughs> turns out to be. But um, yeah, so the point is that this is kind of a, you know, sort of an Occam's razor kind of approach. And, um, you know, sitting here in Oxford, this is uh, one of the earlier papers that we can quote 1321. So the idea is that you, that you, you um, kind of, you, you stick for each complexity of a problem, you stick to the you know, complexity of, of the nature of that solution. And that is the observed data, for example, or, or the model space here. Right, so, so why, why is the data kind of, um, um, you know, predominantly um, layered or spherically symmetric? Well, I, I guess it's very natural. It, it, it comes from very simple um, physical effects. And you see that in multiple scales, like in Grand Canyon here, and the, the phase transitions and boundaries of the Earth's interior as well as the basic structures of the, of the near surface areas. And what is it? It's basically just the primordial differentiation of the Earth's interior, the mineralogical transitions, and all of that, of course, is to do with, with uh, thermal density and, and gravitational topics. So um, the fact that you know, the, the predominant um, um, physical um, fact about layering um, then, then translates into this wave field being predominantly spheric symmetric is, is absolutely logical. Now, um, can we, can we, you know, is, is it sufficient to just stick to the one dimensional structures and, and solve actually interesting problems? And the answer is, is I think, yes. So here are, are a number of really diverse topics and I'll just browse through a few and show you that, that these, um, you know, at least fit the data, which is a topic in itself, whether that's an actual solution to anything. But what you see here is, is uh, Martin van Driel's um, um, rendition of a kinematic fault rupture over a hundred thousand point sources. And what you see is, is how these 100,000 point sources fit the observed data extremely well. And this is in a one-dimensional background model. This is done with InstaSize. And as you see later, this becomes very cheap with InstaSize. So we, we did this for 100,000 sources in 12 CPU hours. So a lot faster than an actual numerical solution. Now, um, similar, very, very similar, um, ocean sources. So, so in this problem, as I guess many of you will be involved in, in, in SPIN, um, you, you have essentially noise, sort of, uh, you know, random vibrations of, of noise in, in all of the uh, ocean surfaces across the, the Earth's, um, Earth's oceans. So what you see here is basically a, a, a wave height model that we've taken, and that is being translated into 100,000 individual point ocean noise sources. And, and that then drives a, a random um, source um, that generates a global, you know, vibroscape, a, a global kind of... Um, um, excitation of noise. And, and if you do that with, with these sorts of noise um, approaches, what you see also is that, that you, can, you can match the data um, quite well with, with these wavefront models. Again, coming from 100,000 individual sources. Again, this is done with, with uh, InstaSize and, and the fact that these one-dimensional models kind of average over, over you know, the, the lateral heterogeneities is, is a helpful added um, benefit of this, of course. And a very different scale here, uh, Lucia Gualtieri, uh, quite a few years ago now, um, worked on actual landslides and their seismic, um, their seismic measurements. So this is 
I think it was in Alaska, where, where she looked at receivers you know, a few dozens of kilometers away from an, a, a large uh, landslide in a mountain and, and observed these, um, these three component uh, data of, of a directional force. And that's quite interesting because it tells you a lot about you know, remote sensing of the mass that came down, the direction it came down with, the speed. So it does have sort of connections to observing this and providing complementary information. Again, uh, you see synthetics and data. And again, with, with very simplistic one-dimensional models, you can fit this data really well. Of course, it doesn't capture everything, but, but I think we can learn about the Earth. And then lastly, on this one-dimensional stuff, here's um, some extraterrestrial uh, seismology. Um, this is mostly Simon Stehler's work at this stage. Um, one was on Europa. So that's one of the jo jo Jovian moons, icy moons um, that, that have a sub superficial ocean. And now we, we even hope to have missions going there. What you see here is basically just a question of what does the wave field look like when you, when you impinge um, you know, these tidal forces onto a subsurface ocean and, and uh, possibly record them with a seismometer on the surface. So this can give, give us more hints as to how thick these oceans are and some of the, the um, yeah, interior, interior properties. And the same on Mars, of course, um, there was a lot of work with InstaSight and, and Axisem beforehand to come up with these blind tests and, and even now it's still used for, for benchmarking various different models for Mars. So yeah, these are, these are one dimensional um, problems. Here is another um, graduate from Heinos group who was in a postdoc in Oxford as well, Kasra. He did uh, tomography at the lowermost mantle for the most part um, with P diffracted waves. So these are waves that diffract around the core metal boundary. And as such, they're difficult to, to assess with, with sort of classical rate, ray theoretical um, techniques. But we, we do observe them at three seconds. So we needed um, global synthetics at three seconds to sort of fit them to the data. And that's what you see here. So these are fits at three seconds um, between you know, observed data and, and seismograms. And he's done that for a million different events and uh, or different different recordings. And that, that is not feasible to this day with, with uh, three-dimensional methods. So again, it, it sort of provided a very powerful tool to, to do the measurements for a very large scale seismic, uh, um, seismic inversion. Um, and lastly, like I said, MC kernel, and this is one image of, of how this works, is a, a way of having sort of um, uh, multi-scale uh, kernels um, that live on different grid sizes. And what you see here is sort of a kernel projected onto a very complex mesh, or mu mu multiple phases, actually, a kernel for different phases. And that's, that's the work of Simon Stieler. Again, what's behind this is one-dimensional Earth uh, um, wave fields. Okay, now I want to discuss in a few slides what InstaSize and Zunjin really are, and then show how, how that works on the, on the um, command line. So basically, InstaSize is, is an idea that we had coming out of Axisem. And that's the idea that, that um, which Axisem will describe later. Basically, um, what about having, having a, a database rather than a new simulation that incorporates all of the possible um, source receiver configurations for a given 1D model? So in other words, um, when you have a 1D model, um, there, there are some inherent symmetries such that you only simulate a certain amount of, of um, wave fields. And then, and then because of the sim symmetries of the wave field, you can, you can basically rotate them rather than having to re-simulate them. And these rotations are such that we only need two simulations to cover every source receiver combination um, that is needed for this one-dimensional background model. So this drove the idea to say, well, we can, we can afford to store this even at one hertz, a so very high resolution. And, and then just basically have the, the question of extracting synthetic seismograms being nothing but a database problem where you extract from this database, you have to make it accurate and fast essentially. So we did that, that was mainly with Martin von Driel and Leon Krischer. And, and what this uh, basically means is, is you have two initial simulations, they create this database, and then we need to do some interpolations in space and time and so on, and have, have it such, you know, the, the sort of bookkeeping organized such that it's really fast. And that worked really astonishingly well. We, we called this InstaSize because it, it really allows you to extract seismograms at even one hertz from this database within uh, seconds or milliseconds. So um, yeah, so what we do is basically save, save for all these depth ranges um, down to 700 kilometers for the earth, for example, two seconds to 100 seconds all of these wave fields. And then from, from the initial displacements, we can then 
by storing all of the spectral elements information, um, we can actually compute the strains on the fly. So as you extract it, we actually compute the strain, um, right? So, so this is this is what one example of this uh, exercise GUI, which I'll present um, in my uh, other uh, slide here as well. What you see here is basically a. Um, I'll, I'll just do this on on the other computer. I'll skip through this, um, and I'll do this in a moment. Let me just skip to Syngin. Syngin is a web interface that that works on InstaSize and that's hosted at Iris. So there's a link down here. And what that means is that you can go on a web and you can request synthetic seismograms for these different Earth models. These are global Earth models. They also exist for Mars, by the way. And, and you get them with a tarball or a sort of zip file, zip, zip file very quickly. Um, there are also command line options, and I'll show that in a moment. Um, and the point is, is here that, that you don't need to simulate. So whenever you, you're interested in, in, in synthetic seismograms for any 1D model that's amongst these, you will get any any sort of combination of sources, receivers, you know, filtering, whatever you want, from this the Syngin or InstaSize uh, database. Um, yeah, so so let me switch to the other computer where I'm going to show some of these um, InstaSize and and uh, Syngin, um ideas. Do you have any questions so far? Cool. Let me just make sure I can connect here. All right, can you see? Yes. Uh, yeah. Good. Great. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is how simple it is to use these InstaSize and, and Syngin tools. I wanted to start with the InstaSize GUI. So Instasize.net is a web page. It's fairly easy to install. Once you've installed Instasize, you can download that GUI, you know, um, and and that allows you to um, to basically do this interactively. So what you see here is this GUI. It's empty at this point. And can you see that? Yeah. And what we need to do in the first place is load a database, and we can do this by loading them from Syngin. You can also have them sort of locally stored or computed yourself, but but um, let's just load one from Syngin and, and it's, it's very easy to do this. So basically here's the Syngin website um, with lots of documentation. And what you see here are the different databases. So this is you know, with different frequency ranges and components and whatever, and also Mars if, you, if you're interested in that. So we'll just use, let's say Prem, one of the one I mentioned Earth models and Isotropic at 10 seconds. It's not the highest resolution, but, but it's fair enough. So all you have to do is put Syngin, um, you know, sort of the URL uh, syntax here, that, and then it should load the um, whole database from Seattle. And that's, that's it. So it's here. What you see here is now the um, synthetic seismogram for a specific source receiver configuration, as you see on this, um, on this map on the Earth. But let's first low pass. So this was 10 seconds. So we can, we can low pass it at 10 seconds, maybe. And you should see that waveform changing. Yeah, so you see some changes. We can also add tau p um, travel times. I don't know if you've seen that earlier today. Um, this is just a ray theoretical package that is quite useful for global seismology. It computes um, phases, essentially. So what you see here is basically the tau p, so it's an independent uh, measurement um, that gives you the, the arriving uh, the arrival time for the P wave and then all these different phases here as well. Now you see, you see here, these are the three different different uh, components. Um, of course, here you have the surface wave. And over here, you can manipulate all of these different things. So you can manipulate the um, source receiver uh, locations. So look at this map now. Here's the, the yellow star as the source and the, um, the triangle in red as the receiver. I'm just going to click on maybe Australia because that's where Jack's from. We already have the source near Nigeria, so that's that's convenient. <laughs> Two people from my group here in the call. Okay, so this is this is the um, this is the uh, seismogram that comes, you know, it's being observed in Australia um, due to an event in sort of West Africa here. And and this this works very quickly. So you can you can basically right click or left click, and and it, it retrieves from this database a completely different different um, sort of um, waveform or different part of the database. You can also manipulate um, 
the the depth, for example, here. So you see here, it's a bit it's a bit squished, which I think is due to my Linux version here, actually. Um, yeah, not quite know how that works. But basically, once you once you go through different depths, it's quite interesting to look at how the waveform changes, particularly the surface wave. And then you can manipulate um, the, the moment tensor. You can actually add finite source as well, so distributed source. And all in all, I think it's it's a nice tool for sort of intuitive getting a feel for for how seismograms look like without having to do any simulations. That is, um, yeah, the Insta size GUI. Now you can also, when you when you're really interested in downloading a lot of um, synthetics, but also data, you can do this by um, various tools here. And I was going to show you um, also how easy that is with with some of these tools that we've we've um, added with 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 Iris and other people. So what you see here is um, a command called fetch syn. Can you see that? So that stands for fetch synthetics. And what it does is basically query the, the um, database, the Syngen database at Iris and downloads these, these com corresponding data. So you don't need to install anything. This is a command line. You need to install fetch sim, but it's a command line thing. And then, and then what we have is a synthetic um, zip folder and that unfolds into three components here. And we can run this, I wrote a little um, Python script with just looking at plot fetch sim. And I hope that plots, yeah, that plots the seismogram with OpSpy. I can I can give you all these scripts. They're very easy scripts. So that's that's just using um, um, fetch sim. There's also a way to compare this to data, and I promise that we can solve problems very well with one-dimensional synthetics. And I'll um, I'll hope to convince you um, of this by by running this. Script, this other script I have here. Let's see. So, what you see here is just loading some functions in OpSpy and then plotting. So, what I'm doing is basically downloading actual data from Iris. So, this is for, I forget which event it is, um, but it, it downloads the raw data from Iris. Okay. So, this is a raw data file from Iris. What we do next is, is remove the filter. So we, we need to apply the filter uh, corrections, the filter. And we get this one here. Sort of so quite noisy, of course. And next we, we, we download the exact equivalent synthetic. Okay, so, so we've downloaded an event by means of a time window. And now we can, we can download through Syngen the exact um, equivalent synthetic for a one dimensional model. Looks like that. So you probably don't see quite the differences, but that's where we have um, the last plot, which is basically showing how similar the P waves look. So you see here now a zoom into um, the the, the uh, synthetics on top and the data at the bottom. And this this is sorry, data of course on the top and, and synthetics at the bottom. But this is this is you know zoom into the P wave and and. Um, one dimensional, like I said in, in the first data plot, one dimensional Earth models um, are extremely good at, at um, approximating the direct um, body waves essentially, just because these, these interfaces are absolutely dominant. So, this is, this is how Syngen and InstaSize work. Do you have any questions about those? Okay. I'm going to go back to this screen. If I can find it. All right. So um, now I just want to basically roll back to to uh, um, to Axisim, to to you know the, the code that we started with, but which which is behind InstaSize. So again, here's just a list of of some of the problems that you can solve, which kind of you know are, are between having a one D model. They're not 
1D is not sufficient for solving these, but they can also be solved at the cost of a 2D problem. Um, and I'll, I'll show just a few of those. So here's, here's um, work from, I call this preparation, but it was actually a paper that we published in 2018 with uh, Ritzema and Van Kaken and people. So, so here was basically a approach where we said, we have a, a geodynamic uh, simulation of thermochemical um, um, heterogeneities that, that you know, simulated with, with thermochemical convection code. And that code was actually axisymmetric in itself. So it didn't have more information about 3D either. And then we also had the seismic observations of scattering. Um, um, people like Peter Shearer have done this, for example, here, Mancinelli and Shearer, where they, where they saw um, these peculiar scattering observations, precursors to, to some of the, the sort of um, body waves or, or, or uh, um, phases that go into the outer core and then come back, actually, PKP, um, yeah, like this one here. And they interact with these blobs. And, and the question was, can we modify or use these geodynamic models such that we can constrain the scope of, of this kind of scattering with, with axisymmetric blobs. So what does that mean? It basically means we have a two-dimensional plane. Axisymmetry means that you put some heterogeneity into this two-dimensional plane. And physically speaking, it kind of replicates a thorus, a, a, sorry, a torus structure. But in the in-plane direction, so just along this two-dimensional plane, it will pick up kind of the correct in-plane scattering of these kinds of structures. So we did that and it worked quite well for, for these kinds of uh, input models from geodynamics. Another problem is at the core metal boundary. So we have these very small um, scale observations of what we call ultra low velocity zones. These are 10 kilometer sized, um, very, very um, strongly heterogeneous um, structures just sitting on top of the core metal boundary. And we still don't kind of have a robust theory for what they really are and where they're located. And, what other dynamical processes they might be associated with. So, so one question is, you know, to understand these extremely complex wave fields um, coming from these ultra low velocity zones, we, we kind of need to, need to have a modeling scenario because you can stare at the data for however long you want, you will not understand it, it's, it's really complex. And why is that? Well, it's because even in, in 2D, so for an axisymmetric um, kind of rendition of these ultra low velocity zones, this is how these wave fields look like. And these are kind of realistic structures. So it's, it's beautiful in a way, it's extremely complex. And, and it basically um, leads to multiple sort of virtual sources that happen at these edges and they, they produce new wave fields essentially that come back to the surface. But, but what we basically need to do is, is kind of construct um, a understanding of, of, of these interactions. And that's what we're still in the process of doing is to dissect really the entire wave field between one dimensional UV disease, two and a half D sort of axisymmetric and full 3D, which I'll show later on today. So these are, these are extremely complex wave fields. And, um, and these are some of the sort of annotations that we've put to them. And again, you, you kind of need these kinds of high resolution approaches to, to a two dimensional structure. And lastly, something that um, we published with Martin van Driel is uh, the, the question of inner, inner core anisotropy. So there's, there's an inherent anisotropy between two hemispheres in the inner core that I think many people would have, would have um, agreed on by now. And, and when, when, you, when you have you know, um, seismic observations of this, they have to be seen at, at one hertz, otherwise they, they, they you know, get washed away by the other phases. So, so it's a very tiny window where they can be observed. Um, so far, people have only done it with travel times and said this has to come from this anisotropy. So essentially, there are different, different uh, you know, paths th through this anisotropic region arriving at different speeds. And people said this has to be due to this anisotropy. Now, um, with Axisem, what we've managed, and this is something you cannot do with, with something like Gemini or, or Mode or, or, or these codes because it's inherently 2D, we, we have a tilted anisotropy in the inner core. And then, and then put the wave field through it, and we can observe these seismograms through it. Um, we haven't taken this further, but, but I think it's a very nice setup for, for studying these sorts of problems. OK, so these are just some motivations for actual 2D problems um, at global scale. And here is just a sort of quick overview of what Axisim is all about. Um, here is, is the essence. I really tried to sort of limit it to the very basics. Um, essentially, when you have axis symmetry, what that means is you put your source along this axis and your, your domain is kind of rotationally invariant uh, around this axis. So if you take this D-shaped domain, you rotate it and everything is, is identical. So in other words, you kind of have this donut shape. Whenever you have an anomaly here, it's, it's, it takes up this donut shape. 
Now, what does that mean mathematically? It means that for a displacement wave field, a three-dimensional displacement vector, um, in a source-dependent way, what happens is that this that this is um, azimuthally, um, um, let's say, analytically expressible. So, so for explosion sources, so those are sources that you know don't vary in the azimuth, um, the the three-dimensional wave field is just identical to to um, the one that's observed in SMZ, which is a two-dimensional domain. In in for more complicated moment tensors, so so those are basically full earthquake sources, and this is what Heiner alluded to that we developed with Tony Darling. Um, you can you can easily make this ansatz and then and then uh, turn that into a, a weak form and, and solve it essentially by having different expressions for the dipole moments you know monopole dipole and quadrupole mo moments of the um, of the radiation patterns and these are analytical expressions and that's the key so because they're analytical it means you can evaluate them analytically and the three dimensional domain that you set up in the beginning collapses to a two dimensional domain so in other words. Um, you, you set up with this, this weak form, you have an integral expression, you plug this into this integral expression and these integrals over phi, the azimuth, they just collapse into, into constant factors of pi. So that's the, the, the basic setup for this axisymmetric approach. Um, this method of course has been around for quite some time and um, it, it does incorporate viscoelastic and anisotropic models, kinematic sources, we've computed it up to two Hertz. Um, there's net CDF IO. So it, it does have quite a few features, although it's it's not the, the latest code. Here are just some ideas on how the meshing looks like. It's it's of course being in 2D, it's in, in sort of a half D shaped domain. It's quite easy. We've done it of course for Earth, but also for the field sun as I'll show later. And then when you add the two dimensional structures, they sort of become perturbations on top of this uh, um, one dimensional Earth model, uh, one dimensional mesh. Um, right. Um, just a few slides on the on the theory. So, of course, you've seen this. This is the weak form for the uh, linear elastodynamic system. Um, mass term, stiffness term, and, and single force and moment tensor term. And and this is just to show how this translates into the axisymmetric um, sort of collapse of dimension. So here you have basically three dimensional integrals over u, and with all of these other factors. But the point is that u um, is basically subject to these, these, these symmetries that I've showed in the previous slide. With these symmetries, um, you then um, basically, or the integrals here, each of these integrals collapses in the in the phi dimension. And that's why we get basically um, the, oh, that was already the last slide. That's why we get the, the two-dimensional expression and the two-dimensional uh, mesh for axisem. That's as far as I wanted to go on the theory of axisem. I'm gonna show how we simulate that briefly on my other machine again. Do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, maybe one question, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Uh, in terms of the axis symmetry, you mean that the earth is a cylinders or it's a still a ball? Oh, no, very good question actually, yes. Um, so we, we, um, we solved the whole system in a cylindrical, um, in a cylindrical coordinate system, but it's it's for a for a sphere. So so the way that works is basically having S and Z are the components. So S is basically the distance from the axis, mm -hmm. and Z is is the um, the um, um, well going from the center to 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 the north pole or the, the rad radius basically along the axis, and then phi is the azimuthal direction. But it's it's exactly constrained by the by the um, by the um, uh, sphericity. So, I mean, when I say um, cylind um, spherical ball, it's not quite correct. So basically we solve it completely in a, in, a, in, a, in a cylindrical way, but the initial setup with the boundaries and so on is actually a spherical coordinate system. Uh, it's like uh, when you simplify the wave equations, you consider, I mean, in this spherical symmetric way. Uh, or no, we, we do that actually completely in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the cylindrical. Um, system. Uh -huh. What we do specify in the in the um, spherical system are the interface uh, conditions between the solid and the fluid, mm -hmm. for example. So these are very specific boundary um, terms that pop out of the weak form when when you when you solve for these interface conditions between solid solid and fluid, and those those terms are actually discretized in, in a purely spherical way. But but um, the beauty of these kind of spectral methods is that that everything becomes local. 
right? So once you once you've computed the um, the um, Jacobians from uh, mapping basically between the uh, physical domain to the elemental domain, um, everything is local. So you just everything is in this Jacobian transformation. Mm -hmm. And what we've derived is basically how mm -hmm. to map from a spherical, uh, sorry, from a cylindrical uh -huh. um, um, expression of these S, Z, and, and phi values mm -hmm. that that you know go go along exactly the spherical boundary into into the reference domain. Uh, so it's something, so it's something similar. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, is this similar to what Heiner mentioned? How to map the uh, tomography into a flat geometry? Is that? Similar tricks. Um, no. I, I'll, I'll get to that in Axiom 3D. It's it's a bit different. I mean, fundamentally, depending on how abstract you want to look at this, um, fundamentally, all of these these sort of mappings are Jacobian transformations, right? As soon as you, mm -hmm. you transform one coordinate system yeah. to another, it's kind of a Jacobian transformation. Yeah. Then how you know granular you look at this problem, you, you could identify it with either just a regular Jacobian transformation or particle relabeling or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, the particle relabeling that we use in Axiom 3D, which I'll get to later on, that is 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 a bit different. It's a bit deeper. It comes from elasticity theory. Um, and it has to do with with you know other things. But but the um, Jacobian transformation, I mean, is is completely inherent to any of these at least weak forms, because you you, you always you know in this finite element spectral element realm, you always solve your your integrals on an elemental you know Cartesian reference basis. So it means whatever complex geometries you have, you always need to map them. And you, you have to have that mapping available, either mm -hmm. analytically or numerically. Yeah. And in Axis M, we actually have this analytically because we, we know exactly the transformations from these spherical boundaries to, to the reference domain. But the spherical boundaries are actually expressed in cylindrical coordinates. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thanks. I could send you the papers where that's you know, in great detail. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, I just wanted to show you briefly how um, how Axisim works. It's it's fairly easy. So once you install it, you can download this tarball from CIG, for example. Um, you end up basically with, with two uh, broad um, um, Packages and that's the measure and the solver and that's that's similar for many many of these uh, numerical methods that we're discussing here. There's an extensive manual. It doesn't cover everything to the same detail, but it, it's very detailed on installation and so on and, and running the code. Um, it's less detailed on actually implementing two-dimensional structures. So that's something that unfortunately we don't have the resources to support. Um, right. So once you once you are in in this Axiom folder, you. you First, you have to generate a mesh. So you go into measure, and I just wanted to show you how these um, input files look like. So it's it's fairly simple. Basically, you just sort of manipulate three or four different um, parameters. So you see a background model here. You can do prem anisotropic or some other ones like like the ones in here. Um, and you can also do an external model, which is what we did for Mars, for example, and, and the Sun. Um, then you specify the dominant period. And that's, of course, crucial for the resolution of the mesh and, and the cost in the end. And you specify the number of slices. This is for parallelization. So I'm just going to leave it at that. It's an isotropic prem model at 50 seconds and run it. And I do it by the submit script. Ah, she compiles it. Sorry, I didn't know it was compiling. The actual measure is a lot faster than the compiling. I think it's finished already. It's finished, yeah, done with measure. So the measure basically just, it's, it's, a, it's an intricate procedure, but it, it, it finishes in, in lightning speed. And what you can do is, is actually quite instructive if you look at some, some plots here. So it, the, the measure dumps these, um, these different, different files. Uh, let's see what I have in codes. Um, Measure and then diagnostics basically has these different files for the mesh. So you can do, you can load the um, the um, VP velocity and this is the, the kind of mesh. So if you, if you add these um, these wedges, you see, you see how this the spectral mesh looks like. So it it, it map it meshes um, essentially 
the crust. So you see here these crustal layers. And then, and then what we have to do is we sort of faced with the, the doubly detrimental problem in that wave speeds increase with depth, but dimensionality decreases. So we want to have the same size basically for each element according to the wave speed or wavelength. And so it's sort of ballpark, you know, size is one wavelength per element. But as the wave speed increases with depth, we want to have wider elements essentially. And to do this in a conforming sense, which is how this is different from the discontinuous Galerkin, we need to have basically these boundaries completely conformal, which is why we, we have these, just like in spec from these, these kinds of um, features in here where we double the mesh spacing. And that is in this two dimensional context is very automated. So this, this, mesh is, this meshing is really easy. In 3D, this becomes a serious problem. Yeah, so, so there are multiple of these kinds of plots that you can pull up in Paraview. Um, right, so once we've done the, the um, meshing, you basically just move the mesh. And um, I've done that already, so I'll skip that. You then go to the solver, and the solver is um, also, I mean, it's of course a bit more complicated because it's also a whole system, but, but the, um, the manipulation is quite easy, I should say. So basically, um, this is the, the main input file, it's called imparam basic. And the things you specify here is basically the source type, the length of the seismogram, the um, stations where you want to record it, the background model that you've just computed, whether you put in lateral heterogeneities, attenuation, you can save snapshots and make movies, um, that sort of thing. So, um, right, this is, this is how that works. And I just um, um, call this spin. This is a simulation upon this mesh and it, looks like this. So now there's a folder spin and it contains all of these. And so it's running on this laptop, 10 seconds done already. This is for a 50 second global wave field. So it just gives you one idea. The neat thing of course, is that um, simulations for a two dimensional structure are almost um, not slower than a one dimensional. They can be in, in specific circumstances, but if you just manipulate you know, some blobs in addition to the background structure, it's, it's about the same speed. So this is 50% of the simulation done. Yeah, anyway, this is kind of what I wanted to show you about these codes. Like I said, I glossed through them quickly and, and um, um, surely you can't just recall this, but I think they're very self-sufficient, um, all of these, so in Society Engine and Axisem. I think with, with the manuals and then if you, if you have some intricate questions, you can ask, of course, but otherwise I think they're, they're fairly instructive to, to download and play with. Okay, simulation finished. So yeah, the, the neat thing with these cheaper methods is that, that you, can, you can run them on your laptops and so on, and, and um, they're fairly easy to manipulate. So that's, that's it about Axisem. Um, do you have questions? Stop sharing. Um, yes, hi. hi. Yes. I saw in the perimeter file something about lateral heterogeneities. Yeah. How do you, I may have missed that during the presentation, but how do you include them without essentially jeopardizing the entire assumption that you've got a cylindrically? Yeah, so, so, um, so when we what we call lateral heterogeneities is uh, is not three dimensional lateral it's it's just in plane so it basically those are heterogeneities in the plane of that mesh right that's this donut that I had earlier in the, in the presentation so in other ways in other words um, there's a wave that that you know wave field that comes in and interacts with with this sort of blob that is essentially a torus and then picks up that scattering propagates through but all in the in plane direction. So it's still exactly axisymmetric by construction, by construction of that method. Um, but it does pick up the in-plane um, um, heterogeneities. So like I said, when, when you know, pulled out this example with the thermochemical blobs, for example, those were computed in a, in a geodynamic model that was axisymmetric as well. So that was exactly the same dimensionality. Um, other examples are, of course, this very small scale stuff that you can't afford in 3D. Um, actually, I'll show some examples how we can do it now. But um, other, otherwise, you, when you propagate a wave also through, let's say, uh, three, 3D structure that's fairly smooth, 
like a tomographic model, for example, then um, the wavelengths at high resolution, the wavelength is, is so small with respect to the structure that it, it often doesn't see the three-dimensional curvature. So we've, we've done that for a few examples in tomographic models, and it's astonishing how, how, how well the axisymmetric um, laterature heterogeneities pick up these in-plane in -plane solutions if there's not strong scattering from, from, from the third dimension. I don't know how confusing this is to people. So what, what this lateral heterogeneity in axisym neglects is what's called off-plane scattering. So off-plane scattering is, is basically you have a source and a receiver here, and, and the wave, you know, wave field propagates in between here. Off-plane scattering is basically a energy that, that propagates out of the plane, interacts with some structure, and then goes back into the plane to the receiver. That is something that axisym cannot handle because, because it violates this, this axisymmetric assumption. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the question is always, you know, how, how relevant is off-plane scattering? And um, we, I, I had a master student just last year and about to submit a paper with that. Um, it's a very interesting question. I think, I think it's completely problem dependent. And in, in many global scale applications, off-plane scattering isn't very, isn't very prevalent, nor easily observable, unless you go to extremely high resolution. Yeah, okay. mm. Good, thanks. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Of course, also in this in the spin context, um, we're very interested in in, in the gradient. And uh, yeah. uh, okay, for recalculating the entire database would be difficult. But you know, I asked that a thousand times before. But for your new versions, would it be possible that you add the option that uh, you know you could directly output the the gradient so that you could that we could get the the strain components and the rotations. Because so, for example, for, for one problem, axis in, in 2D would be already very like uh, very relevant. For example, to understand this increased amplitude that we see in rotations here in the in the in the sedimentary basin in Munich versus Wetzel in, in the bedrock. So mm -hmm. probably there the scattering problem would not be so hard, but uh, it's a side effect, and and maybe that could already be done. So my question is, can you already output? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, this Wavefield movie that I showed that was um, the output was basically the curl and the and the divergence of the wave field. So we we have that. I have to check where exactly we did that, and then of course insta size. I mean implicitly computes the strain and with it all of the gradients and i think that will be the easiest manipulation if insta size is a thing oh no you said lateral lateral heterogeneity right so would be well yeah it uh, but you know I mean, we can do it easy. with we have done it we've used insta size and, and did it with uh, you know small scales array so use array derived rotation but it's an overkill and it's it's not elegant yeah. Yeah, um, it would just be cool to have it uh, have it direct. I mean, basically, all of the all of the ingredients are there because yeah, 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 sure, sure. Also, I mean, the, the way we save the axis and wave fields for insta size includes all of that. It includes you know the the spectral element Jacobian information, so we can compute the strains in, in insta yeah, yeah. So in in other words, just the the output of axis and database should be possible to extract all of the gradients. It, it might be useful to talk with, with Leon about this or, or Martin, if, if they're still happy to talk about these things, because it yeah, might just be a few lines of changing things. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it's, you know, we did it with, with for the first yeah. ever paper in, in the ring laser data, a Bernhard Schubert did it in SpecFem, and then, you know, it, yeah. it never made it into the, into the overall yeah. solution, which is a pity. Because it's it is very useful and it's now beginning to be very interesting also in connection with DAS. Yes. Uh, uh, to do that, so I recommend all the all the developers always allow the output at, at least you know mm. of all gradient components. Then you you can you know develop everything you want. Um, you know, basically allow twelve components or ten components at the surface output. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to confirm that in Axiom 3D, that's that's all done. So okay. You get all of the outputs, so str stress Excellent. as well, strain explicitly, and then all of the yeah. different different um, operators. Grab this curl. 
But uh, cool, thanks. I, I, you and I, I'm uh, just so impressed with this, uh, particularly because you can achieve such high frequencies. And um, you know, I've, I'm, I'm still a great fan of, uh, of the axisymmetric 2.5D approach. There's so much you can learn. Yeah, great, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Okay, so so I think um, the idea was to have a break now, and then, yeah. and then we'll re resume with with Axiom 3D. Yeah. Can we do sort of 15 minutes? Yeah. So that's 20 past uh, yeah. we continue. Okay, good. A mesh. All right. Um, so the, the mesh, um, I think, I think it was, was quite astonishing to get the mesh done at least because it, it requires, like I said earlier, as to to, to keep remeshing. This is actually not the, the high resolution one that he had. This is just for demonstration purposes. The high resolution one he had has, has an incredible amount of these, these coarsening layers because you know if you, if you, if you have a your velocity varying by a factor of 200, you continuously need to, to remesh with depth. So for these kinds of uh, continuous element-based methods, meshing such as profile is incredibly difficult. And the advantage of Axiom 3D in this context is that we, we do the meshing in 2D um, which is much easier than 3D. So if you have to do the remeshing in 3D, these, these sort of remeshing layers, they, they take up more space, so it becomes more intricate. Um, we didn't finish it for, for a few reasons. It's a really challenging problem, heliosismology, because you, you need basically gravity and, and the gravitational modes in association with, with, um, with an acoustic body are known as, as unstable. And there are lots of sort of issues that, that, that led us to, to actually move elsewhere. <laughs> But it's a challenging problem, and it's one that I mentioned earlier as well, where, where surface boundary conditions come to play as well. So the wave field here is known to just dissipate as it reaches the, the surface of the sun. Um, and there's no, there's no con distinct surface. It just sort of diffuses away. And there's no known boundary condition, no physical boundary condition that we can sort of formulate at this point. So I think there are still many sort of you know, basic physical problems out there that, that we could capture with these kinds of methods. I think tsunami, as mentioned earlier, is, is certainly another one we as well. All right, so um, scattering is another one. So scattering on Mars is something we looked at. Um, of course, fully 3D. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Anyway, I hope to have convinced you that there are enough 3D problems, even without the realm of, of uh, full waveform inversion and so on, that um, warrant that we, we need 3D solvers, obviously. So so here's the, the, the slide that I had earlier, right? the, the cost between 3D simulations and 1D or 2D, which is kind of the axis. Yeah. And the, the question that we posed for Axiom 3D is, you know, can we can we um, fill this gap? Can we can we find a method that gradually converges between the complexity of the model and, and not just sort of in a binary choice between 3D and and, uh, and axisymmetric, but that adapts um, its cost and its efficiency to the complexity of the model. So that is the basic question that we asked, and, and we um, basically set out to, to look at that. That's that's all Cone Dice work, of course. Um, and the simplest way was to just simulate SpecFem um, synthetics or wave fields and look at them. So here you see a wave field from SpecFem, and in a prem model in this case. So you sort of the, the, the in plane uh, wave field, very complex, of course, just like I said earlier, because of the bouncing of the um, of the interfaces. And then, of course, fully axisymmetric or, or spherically symmetric in the in the azimuthal direction. That's prem. So, so of course, that's what it is. Anyway, so that that is of course an axisymmetric problem, and that's something that we at least have solved with axisem previously. Now the question was, how smooth, especially, is this axis um, the, this azimuthal direction? And it turns out, so first of all, what you see here between these two changes, this is the change between a one D model and a tomographic three D model. So it changes, of course, but not in the level of the complexity. It just changes some arrivals, essentially, right? As you can see here. But the, the actual complexity depth, or whatever you call it, of this in-plane direction is not really much affected either. But much more strikingly is this one here. So we're going away from the exact axis symmetry to this. And that's a very, very smooth um, um, behavior along the azimuth. So in other words, the complexity of the 3D model is by and large, still captured by the um, in-plane direction and not so much by the off-plane direction. Of course, we want to capture this, but the question is, can we capture that in a, in a much coarser um, discretization? So in other words, can we avoid oversampling this third dimension? Because 
as you see, we wouldn't have to sample this this here at the same fine scale resolution as this one here, right? And that's that's kind of what we then post. It's it's smooth. And um, yeah, so here's just a summary. Most wave field complexity is captured by the 1D structures. The 3D um, retains um, very little azimuthal imprint, so that's that smooth structure. And quite curiously as well, 3D wave fields can be smoother than their 3D underlying structures. Anyway, what we set out to do is then to pose the idea that we use AxisM as a basis for this in-plane direction um, using a two-dimensional spectral element expansion. But then instead of these analytical functions that I mentioned earlier for AxisM, we have a finite expansion, a, 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 a sort of finite basis expansion. And we do that with Fourier series for a pseudo-spectral expansion. So in other words, you know, expand this, not analytically as an AxisM, but expand it along a Fourier series where these modes couple and they, they you know, discretize this at a sufficient resolution in the azimuth. And that's what Kornleiter did, um, went ahead and basically started with a ansatz of the displacement solution of the following kind. So you basically have the sort of in-plane um, um, re representation of the, of the axisymmetric structure, there's an R and theta here in, in spherical geometry, but that is then, then coupled with this exponent of the Fourier series through uh, by means of, of alpha. So alpha are these coefficients essentially, coupling coefficients, and, and phi is the, the azimuth, of course. So alpha is, is, the, is a Fourier coefficient and that goes to some number n. And the big question is, where does n go to, to what number? Um, if n is zero, then it's a fully axiometric or sort of invariant model. If it's two, then it's a quadrupole. So it's still something that we have embedded in axis m, um, but we can express analytically. Now, if n is higher than two, then, then of course we need to expand it on a Fourier series. And this is something that we've done for all of these demographic models. And this is, this is a peculiarity of axis in 3D that you need to know what n is essentially, or nu as we call it in the code. So that is the expansion. The neat thing here is that we can adapt this n locally. It just, for each, for each sort of torus here, for each string, um, we can adapt n separately. They don't, they don't need to couple like in, like in a 3D SEM. In a 3D SEM, everything needs to be continuous. So all of the elements have to be continuously coupled. Not the case here. They, this n can have a completely dis, uh, different expansion than this one. Okay, that's, that's the beauty. And that makes this very flexible to adapt it to complexity. Um, right, so, so um, this is, this is what, what the, the essence of the method is basically. This is, I think, even an old way of, of how this is um, being done. But the code essentially um, jumps back and forth between physical domain and, and, and uh, Fourier domain um, twice at least for each time step and does so in a most efficient way to compute all of these gradients and so on. So the, the computation ends up being um, optimized towards you know, where, it's, where it's most efficient. Um, the, the big point of the method and the real take home message is that, that by expanding only along how complex that azimuthal um, wave field is, we, we end up having drastic uh, shortcuts in some, in some cases. Um, it's also important to note that, of course, there's no free lunch, there's no sort of solution for everything. And if you have a wave field that is entirely 3D, and that is essentially to say that the off plane scattering is as relevant as the in plane scattering then this is an overhead that makes it more expensive, okay? So keep that in mind. If, if um, um, a domain is such that the off-plane scattering energy is as relevant as the in-plane scattering energy, so that is there is no predominant layering, then, then this method makes no, gives you no, no benefit essentially. Anyway, so, so there have been quite a few papers on this and um, of course our code as well that we'll look at into a second, but just a few more slides on this, this sort of expansion stuff. Um, basically, right, so, so basically doing this, doing this sort of end computation leaves us with the task to, um, to come up with, a, with, a, with an approach that pre-estimates the, the wave field complexity before we, we run a simulation, before we run a efficient simulation. So we do this with trial simulations and these trial simulations then compute this um, Fourier co expansion coefficient by a convergence analysis, essentially. So what we get are these maps here, so two-dimensional maps. And for each point on the map, for each color here, what you see is, is the maximum coefficient that we need in that point to, to um, discretize the, the azimuthal direction. So, so in other words, what you see here is this was a simulation where here was a source and then here was a blob. And that blob then, then basically creates off-plane scattering, which is captured by the red stuff here. 
but the rest of the domain is a lot cheaper. So in a traditional um, 3D SEM, you would basically discuss everything that, with red here. What we take advantage of is that the, the bulk of the domain is blue. Okay, so we can we can basically drastically reduce the, the risk realization here for much of the domain. Um, right here, you can also see this in a time dependent manner, which I think is quite cool. So you see how that um, goes through a seismogram as well. So it's a, it's a time dependent feature. Um, there are many different ways of, of, of producing this sort of complexity and Claudia has spent the whole chapter in her thesis on this to even expand it to three dimensions, look at different measurements on the wave on a waveform on how to do this because we basically optimize that by the number of peaks in, in, in the seismogram and so on. Happy to talk about it later. But the point is that we have a, a sort of quantification of the wave complexity that we then include as a, as a sort of input to, to run the simulation for us in 3D. Um, right, so what does it leave us? Here is a benchmark between Spectrum and Axon 3D, an early one, where what you see now, um, before I animate this, you see the one dimension, so that's kind of axisem in blue and in red, sorry, in red is axisem 3D, in blue is spectrum, which we take as a reference solution. And here's time, this is distance. So what you see here are the body waves and what you see are the sur surface waves. Strikingly already here, you see that the body waves are entirely accurate already for the one dimensional model. Again, it's the same thing as I've said a few times today that 1D models are actually satisfying up to 90% of the global data. But that's not so much the case for the surface waves, which are in complete sort of cycle skip domain here. Now, as I animate this, what happens is that going from this axisymmetric expansion, um, Chrome Dye basically increased the N expansion gradually. And the N expansion will be shown here. And the speed up will reduce, of course. As we increase N, the speed up reduces. So here, this is the axisymmetric speed up. It's 1,400. And as we animate this, the fit increases and it, it converges completely. And the speed up decreases, of course, as, as N goes up. But it's still to the last wiggle here of the surface wave train retains a 24-fold speed up. Okay, so um, we've done that for many, many um, different scenarios, and it, it strongly depends on many, many different features. So aside from the model complexity, it depends on whether you look at body waves and surface waves and distances and so on, um, undulations of the boundaries. But but here's sort of one one you know rendition of 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 how this looked like. So this was the the spectrum costing. This is the axisem costing, and we indeed managed to basically fill the the intermediate gap. Um, and in all cases that we've simulated, there's at least a tenfold speed up with respect to the spectrum solution. I should mention that in Claudia's work, which focused on, on exploration scale, salt bodies and so on, um, also in all cases she looked at, including these salt bodies and fault structures and so on, um, she did always have at least a tenfold speed up. So that actually surprised us. We thought at the level of salt body complexity, that this overhead of doing the furry domains and so on would, would kill the advantage, but it didn't. It still retained the speed up. And I think it's simply due to the fact that even within salt bodies, you have a contiguous um, um, homogeneity in, in the propagation. So, so within the salt body, there's still, still space of having some sort of smoothness. Um, not always the case, but even, even for these very, very difficult um, scenarios, it still retained the speed up of 10. And of course, as you go to higher frequency, it, it goes higher. And as you go to one Hertz, it becomes a thousand fold or something like that, which is where this DLVC um, simulation came from. Uh, maybe briefly not to spend too much time on the theory. Um, particle relabeling is something that we incorporated with a group of David Alatar in, in Cambridge. And um, it's essentially, um, so I guess Heinrich talked about this already to some extent or not. <laughs> Well, I mentioned it, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's basically, um, it's an approach that comes from sort of elasticity theory where you say that that you can you can sort of discretize your elastic body in different ways. And and, and um, if you discretize it in, in a, uh, or not discretize even, if you just represent it in a different space. And if you represent it in a different space, you can map it to the same, to the same sort of um, elastic deformation. And, and um, that is you know, to do with, with non-uniqueness as well. But, but what it means is basically that you can say, I can get the exact same wave field if I do this and this, but just impose a different type of anisotropic structure underneath it. 
So it's basically translating the effect of that bathymetry or topography or whatever interface you, you undulate um, into a very anisotropic um, medium. That anisotropic medium is actually one that violates the strain energy uh, symmetries. So it's more anisotropic than we observe with the um, elastic media that we're used to with you know, 21 triclinic uh, elements. So um, we did that and it, it turned out to be useful in the sense that we can basically um, use this methodology for um, having topography, ocean bathymetry, core metal boundary topography, all of these sort of undulations without affecting the meshing. So in other words, we can stick to the axis and mesh just a D-shaped simple mesh, and then do everything else on the Jacobian here. So what this effectively does is this, this is a transformation that changes the Jacobian as a term and makes this very, very anisotropic in the end. But it's basically just a sort of geometric transformation um, in the end. That's the effect of it. Right, um, we did benchmarks. Um, those worked incredibly well. So it's a period at five seconds, spectrum against axiom 3D with geographic and no correction for the ellipticity of the earth. And again, it's, it's an excellent fit. I think it's really astonishing how, how it fits every last wiggle in the waveform. Keep in mind that, that um, when you compare these two different methods, um, it's, it's quite painful to, to make them fit because of slight differences in, in, in meshing the interfaces exactly the same way, where there's no sort of one is wrong or the other one's right. Um, it's, it's just, you know, getting it to, to, to work exactly at the same location is not that trivial because they're very different meshing, um, meshing procedures. So all credit to Kungba here for getting this working so well. Okay, so in summary, here are some of the features that the code has. And at this stage, maybe I should say that, that Kungba, I think managed to rewrite it four times completely from scratch. <laughs> Turning from it was in the beginning it was an uh, addendum to the Axisum code in Fortran 90, and then he decided to to um, enter the 21st century and wrote it in C++. And now we have a still brand new code basically, which is extremely slick and and small as well. Um, it's 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 a modern code I would say, and it includes all of these features. So it's a code that that does you know, all in one um, from local scale to global scale, it's easy to do asteroids and, and other planets and so on. And, and um, has anisotropy and attenuation and undulations, of course, as well. So it doesn't have gravity. It doesn't have all the features that Spectrum Globe has, for example. So no, no rotation, no gravity at this stage. We just haven't done it. it has no porosity either. But but for all of these other features, I think it, it, it has pretty much everything um, you could ask for. It scales quite well to 13,000 cores. Um, it's very object-oriented framework. Um, there are potential um, extensions. Maybe I should say one, just one fundamental theoretical limitation of this method. And that is because of this expansion along the azimuth, along a Fourier series, we cannot change the physical system along the azimuth. So we cannot change from solid to fluid, for example, because we solve a different system. It's an acoustic uh, system. So in other words, this is a problem for situations where you want to have a water in an ocean and then transfer that to a continent um, across the azimuth. So we cannot do that. That's, that's one concrete um, limitation. Claudia has worked on, on ideas around this by having localized transformations, Fourier transformations, but we haven't implemented that fully yet. That's for someone else to pick up maybe. Um, we have a paper on using the discrete adjoint methods for, for inversions as well, but it's not fully fledged either. So a lot of this is in flux. And I'm also sad to say that, that um, we just don't have the resources to, to sustain this Kondai's elsewhere. There's no one in my group working on this right now. Um, we hope in the next few weeks actually to, to, to fix a few things and, and, and installation and, um, and um, documentation to the point where this is basically a robust version 1.0 and then we'll publish it as such. But there's still a few hoops that we need to do. Right now, the 3D crust doesn't work fully because the crustal model itself is kind of annoying. So there are a few caveats, but essentially it has all the, the inputs and basis for being a very comprehensive solver. So, um, right, um, the next few slides are basically concrete slides on how to implement models. Maybe at this stage, I'll already give it over to Kondai. Thanks, Hagi. Very question. impressive. Do you have questions about yeah the slides so far? I mean, of course, Kondai will go into much more detail on the code itself and so on.
Hi, Dari. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Kunda. Hi, Kunda. Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay. Um, Kunda, do you want me to run through these slides here? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, you could. I, I don't have any slides. I, I'll basically yeah. present the repository and uh, yeah, examples. I mean, just talk and let me let me know when to proceed. Yeah. Hmm. Wait, I thought you you continue talking about this stuff. Oh, the model. Um, <laughs> I think I think yeah yeah. If you're not presenting, I can I can switch to you know. My screen. Yeah, so I mean, so I had these, these, these here. Do you want to talk about these? This is how to load a model in Axiom 3D. No, that, 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 that's, I think it's the, the old ones. So you'll cover that in your other stuff? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I mean, that, yeah, those, yeah. So I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. That kind? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you share. Okay. So, uh, how, 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 how many minutes I have? 40 minutes. Again. Okay. Sorry, I'm not. not I joined uh, uh, So, the program is until 5 30, but if you go a few minutes over, I think that's okay. But, uh, uh, five, five, try five, not to make it too long. Uh, five, five, yeah, yeah, okay. Five, five, five. Yeah, I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, in this uh, brief session, I just talk a little bit about about the the new Axum three D, basically the new code I I wrote uh, uh, when I was doing PhD with Tari. So uh, uh, this is new code, and this is a repository. You can search it. Uh, very easy to find. And uh, I, I just talk about the code. And, and currently, the, 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 the development uh, of this code is, I mean, it's not complete. And the main uh, caveat is the, is the documentation. So the code itself, I think, is pretty comprehensive. It contains a, a diverse, a less diverse re, uh, request of like input, output, wave field output, everything. But uh, uh, unfortunately, usually people can't take full advantage of it because the documentation is kind of uh, lack behind. But we do have sort of a, a, like a half, half down uh, uh, documentation uh, uh, where you can go over these, uh, uh, see these different things and see the input parameters and uh, the installation. So uh, this installation has been updated. If you, if you, I mean, maybe there's some people have used uh, the new Axiom 3D uh, uh, like uh, 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 last year or half year ago, and the installation is quite difficult. Uh, that was because when I when I developed it, I, I used uh, like a C plus plus seventeen standard, and uh, at that time the uh, the support on C on, on HPC was not very good. And also I was using the development version of Eigen, which is a very good library for linear algebra. But uh, like after two years of development uh, work, Eigen has been greatly improved and it's very stable now. So the installation of, of Axum 3D is quite, I think it's quite easy now. At least it's uh, it, the dependencies are purely uh, conduct based. So we don't have to compile anything from the source. So I think it's, it should become much easier. So, uh, uh, so about the code. Uh, uh, so uh, this, this is basically the, the repository and uh, uh, it, it has a very simple structure. So this solver is, you know, contains the code and usually users don't have to look at anything inside. So it's just uh, uh, follow the, uh, if you want to use Axiom 3 this basically what you need to do is go over this installation page so you will, you, you will be using Conda to install uh, these dependencies, and then you compile Axiom 3D with uh, first doing say make and then doing make. So these steps cannot be automated because mainly because MPI, like different versions, particularly on the HPC. So you have to compile it. Uh, 
Okay, so this is about uh, the installation. And uh, there's a folder uh, called example where we provide two examples. I'll present here with my IDE. So uh, for the examples, uh, actually we are actually collecting examples from, uh, from uh, the users, not from all, just from Oxford, but from uh, uh, everywhere. But currently uh, I have, we have very two stable uh, examples where uh, through these examples, one can learn uh, how to do uh, 1D and 3D simulations uh, with at a global scale or regional scale and local scale. So the first example is global scale and the second example is, uh, uh, is Cartesian, so it's local scale. And the regional scale is just a truncated uh, spherical, uh, is truncated a global scale problem. So uh, uh, I, I just briefly talk about the, how you basically run Axon 3D. So to run Axon 3D, uh, uh, there are uh, some, uh, th these are the input, uh, input uh, parameters. So the input parameters for, for the input parameter, we are using like JSON style or YAML. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, advanced JSON style. Uh, so uh, uh, we have five input files here as this first example. So in this first example, I'll be showing how we do. Uh, so the problem is, uh, let me find that. Okay, so in this problem, we have the earthquake at Virginia and uh, it's very basic problem. And we simulate seismograms on these uh, stations. So we have two uh, sets of stations. The first is the global uh, seismic stations. And the second is, uh, is US array where we have the all the uh, transportable uh, seismograms, sorry, as trans transportable seismometers. Uh, so what we do here, like uh, if I quickly go over these, these files. Uh, so the first, when you want to do a simulation, of course, you need a model, right? And uh, so for Axism 3D or for Axism, you need to create some sort of mesh file, which is based on a 1D uh, Earth model like Prem. Okay, so uh, to, uh, to create such mesh files, you use a tool uh, which is developed by Martin Dandrio. Uh, it's called the Salvas Mesher Knight, which is for Axon 3D. And you do something like Python Salvas Axon 3D, then you choose Prem Anisotropy, and then the period, and then you get the mesh file. So this is very simple. And uh, so once you specify the mesh file, then we have some like, uh, you can specify, for instance, flattening and how, what's the source coordinates in the geodesy tab. And then you can specify absorbing boundary conditions. Uh, so here, uh, like different from other codes, we access in 3D allows the absorbing boundary on the top of the model. So usually it's, uh, if you consider it's on the side and the bottom, but we add absolute boundary on the top is because for the, for the, you know, for the, uh, some, some like uh, atom for simulating atmosphere. Uh, and this is just detailed, uh, detailed. Uh, this Claudia has done a lot of testing on this. So there's a lot of uh, detailed parameters for absolute boundaries and attenuation and a list of 3D models. And this is the place where we implement 3D models. And I'll we'll talk how we implement 3D models later, but here we're doing a 1D Earth model. So uh, there's no 3D models. And uh, uh, the source, we have a look at the source. This is basically this input file defines the seismic source. Like you first determine the time axis, how long you want the seismograms to be, and you want to, do you want to enforce the delta T, the, the time step, and quorum numbers, and integrator? And here uh, we have new mark and symplectic. And uh, now we have the list of sources. So for one simulation, you can have uh, a lot of sources. Uh, for instance, in this simulation, we have one source. So it's a Virginia earthquake. 
and the location, its latitude and longitude, depths, uh, whether you want to consider lepticity to, uh, to when, when you're locating the source, etc. And the, the mechanism, uh, so Axon 3D allows three types of sources. They are moment tensors for our speed, uh, force vectors for something like an impact, and uh, fluid pressure. So if you put a, a, a source in a fluid demand, it has to be a pressure source. So and the data for that, and source time function, we allow for like a Gaussian source time function, or you want to sell like a user defined source time function. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, parameters here, but mostly we don't change them. Okay. So where you specify different types of source time functions. So uh, we have the model and we have the R speed. And uh, then we have to define the output. Right? So the maximum 3D is defined by these station groups. So this is, these are the station-wise output. In the next example, I'll be talking about element-wise output. So basically, you record the wave field on the whole element. So you know the displacement everywhere. Uh, so that's wave field output. So here in this example, we show station output. So I, I'm, I'm thought as a developer, I'm quite happy with this part because we uh, actually have a really, really comprehensive uh, system output output system. So, uh, so to, for instance, in this case, we uh, uh, we the GSN network, we have a, a like station file. You specify the station file. If something looks like that, so. Uh, it's pretty much the similar with uh, SpecFem. You specify the network name, latitude, longitude of the of the stations, and uh, then uh, it gives you like uh, uh, ask you what is the coordinates provided. Uh, so here you can provide latitude, longitude, or you can provide if you if you consider like. The problem, like source centered, you can also provide the distance azimuth, or if Cartesian, you can provide x and y. So things like that. These are not important. Not important. And uh, yeah, and when you uh, and then, uh, so now we have defined stations. Now we want to let the let action three really know what are the response we want. So it's about under the wave fields. So, uh, uh, so we want to say, okay, this station, uh, what kind of response do you want from these stations? First, you choose a choose a corner system. It can be north, east, north, uh, or vertical, or RTZ, which means radial, transpose, and uh, vertical. And then uh, there's a lots of uh, uh, lot. There's a lots of uh, uh, response you can get. So the including displacement, uh, gradient of uh, displacement. So it's a second order tensor, long symmetry. You can get the strain and stress. It's uh, also second order tensor, but symmetric. So it only co contains six component and the curl or the rotation. So you can basically use these, uh, these, uh, these strains to, you know, these names to ask Akin3D to record different types of uh, of of of, of uh, uh, response on that on that station. So for the GSN network here we are using U, which means we will only record the displacement in the three directions. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's 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 most of it. And also you can specify like output type. Uh, you want to use ask or let's say the ask. Uh, and uh, for the US already transportable, uh, everything basically is the same, just specify different. And uh, here we using like different channels. So for instance, when I specify these, which means I want the vertical displacement and the vertical curl. So it's vertical, the actually the horizontal rotation, but in the vertical direction. So the, 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 yeah, and, uh, and the, the EI1 means uh, we want the trace of the string, which basically means the volume change uh, in the ground motion. 
yeah so that that's that's about the uh, the the station wise output uh, and I'll, I'll be talking about uh, like element wise output later uh so that's that so far what i'm talking about is just a general stuff about wave propagation so you remember there are three elements first you need a model second you need a source and third you need stations or some places or some responses you want from basically the output. And uh, these are general input for all the numerical solvers, right? With spectrum, axisum, or any other solvers, you have to specify this, this, these things and different methods has different way of doing that. Uh, so uh, the axisum 3D style is more like, uh, like the spectrum style but instead we're just using a hierarchical structure where you can see it's very, just for better uh, readability. Uh, uh, Solvas, I guess, use a different, use a, it's using a different way if you have used Solvas. Uh, I think it, it's probably more advanced. Uh, so our way is kind of new, <laughs> so no, it's not very new, it's kind of old file-based input parameters. Uh, so uh, this is the 1D uh, case. Uh, so moving to 3D, the only, so there's two things will, will change. First, uh, we have to specify a 3D model. So in this example, we will add a 3D model called S362 anisotropic. It's a global scale, uh, it's global scale uh, tomographic uh, model and uh, to for for this kind of model, you what you can do is you can directly download this model uh, from uh, from Iris EMC database and send this model to Axis without changing them. So uh, it's compatible with the Iris EMC. And if you want to uh, uh, want to change the model or create your own model, you use the same way. And uh, all you need to do is to understand how the Iris EMC model is formatted. It, it's actually, it's, it's very simple. It's a structured grade in the three directions, X, Y, Z, or latitude, longitude, and depth. And this, on this structured grade, you define the VS and VP. So in Axon 3D, uh, for instance, for this global example, you, if you want to add s 362 any, you just download that from EMC and add these lines to the input parameters. So there's a list of 3D models. We have like EMC S362 any, and uh, uh, the type of this model is like structured grade. Okay, and we have uh, three types. So it's the V3D, G3D, and O3D. So V3D means this is volumetric model. Volumetric model is for perturbations of, uh, of P velocity, S velocity, density, elasticity, all these are velocity, a volumetric model. And G3D means geometric, sorry, geometric 3D, where you want topography, like surface topography, bathymetry, uh, command boundary topography, they are ge geometric 3D models. And this very, very special type is called ocean node 3D models, where you want to add like uh, water levels, different, uh, oh, water levels so it's it's rarely used usually just need a constant like water depths right? so <clears throat> it's very special as Tari said we can have fluid ocean but the hard limit is if you want add a fluid ocean it has to be everywhere so if you if you use this for a regional problem like you have a you have a for instance you have you have an earthquake in the middle of Pacific and you want to simulate, uh, simulate the response of hydrophones uh, around that region, that, that is good. Access in 3D can do it. But if you want an earthquake from the ocean and you want response from a continent, this is not doable with real fluid. But the alternative is using this ocean mode. Okay, uh, and then you specify the uh, data file. This file, this is something I downloaded from uh, from uh, from uh, from Iris EMC, and you just put that in the folder, input folder. 
and then you specify like some meta uh, meta information from that file. What is the coordinate system the file is using, and uh, what is the variables of the coordinates code, and uh, things like that. Like what's the unit in the in the file for lengths and for angles, and uh, that that's that's almost everything. And uh, for uh, and then you can use using that file you can. Uh, so there is a, a you can define the perturbations on the on the on the physical properties. For instance, there is one uh, variable called DVS in the file I downloaded from Iris, and I will the the, the uh, sorry the the unit of this file is percent. So for DVS for VS perturbation, I will use zero point one. Okay, zero point zero one. And I also can use this file to change, sort of change the VP as well by half it, for instance. Okay, this is the this is basically the, the, the 3D model. This is the first thing. If you want to do 3D model, you have to add a 3D model to that. Uh, a second, that's very importantly, you have to increase the N. If you remember Tyre's presentation, Axiom 3D is like a, a like uh, on the Atmos direction centered at the source, we have a Fourier expansion. And if you're doing 3D model, you have to increase that number. So uh, when, we, when I'm doing 1D here, I'm using constant, which is, is five. So five is the exact number you need to use for axisymmetry Earth model with, with, a, with a R squared source, okay? Also, for axisymmetric model, if the if the if the, if the source is a coin force or or force vector, the number you will use is three, and if it's an explosion or pressure in the fluid, is one. And for three D model, because the model breaks the axisymmetry of the wave field, then you need a higher number, like higher order of uh, for the Fourier expansion. Uh, here I'm using a constant one, so which means for everywhere in the D-shaped domain, the Fourier expansion will, uh, will have 50 points on the ring, uh, which means like uh, uh, if I express it in the order of Fourier expansion, so basically we are expanding the wave field in 25, so approximately 25 uh, Fourier, complex Fourier coefficients. Of course, as Atarius said, uh, it's very important that we take advantage of it, not using a constant one, but uh, we use uh, uh, like uh, the uh, so uh, like uh, use a higher one when it is required, and lower one for the bulk volume. So what we do is you can put an analytical one, like you can specify the equation to define this, but this still requires some prior knowledge. And uh, what so for that, what we do is we do the wave field scanning. So it's it's kind of very interesting. So we ask by running a trial simulation at a lower frequency, we ask the solver to learn what is the best end field for this problem. And once this is learned, this end field can be used for a higher, higher, higher uh, uh, frequency. Or you can learn that with the same frequency. So, which means this trial simulation will be quite expensive. But then, if you have small modifications to the 3D model, then you can still use this learned uh, end field. So, it's, it's quite hard to, to expand here because it contains quite a lot of <laughs> input parameters. But as I said, uh, most parameters you don't have to change. Okay, uh, let's let's have a look at the, the results. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, this is a Jupyter notebook for post processing. So uh, if you compare uh, Axon three D with uh, uh, with earlier codes like the old Axisim and uh, Spectrum, uh, I, I sort of followed a different philosophy. I just record the wave field in the most efficient way in terms of both I.O. and storage, and uh, sort of require users to use OpSpy and other things to do the post-processing on their own, instead of you know, 
for instance, for, from Spectrum, you can directly, what you can directly get is animations, but we don't do that because, you know, <laughs> we don't have enough uh, development force to do that. So what we do is we try to make the, 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 the solver comprehensive and it can do a lot of things, but uh, for the, for the post-processing part, uh, we have a lot of good stuff like OpSpy, like VTK, Paraview. So we can do that, but that sort of requires a little bit of knowledge about post-processing with Python. So this is the this is the post-processing for the problem I just described. And here, this is the first GSN station. And uh, here I, I just specify that the name after simulation, you get results. And this is called just read from the results and show the difference of like this 1D, because we have done a 1D, uh, 1 and 3D one. Okay. You can reproduce these uh, simulations. Uh, like if you have a laptop, you can quickly install it and reproduce it following the readme files. And it will take like a, a three minutes to do the 1D problem and uh, about 30 minutes to do the 3D problem. And you can compare the difference between the 1D and 3D. As I said, this is uh, like 50 seconds, it's really long period simulation. And the model is a tomograph, very smooth tomographic model. So what you observe uh, here for the body weight is mainly a phase shift. There won't be very much, you know, wave field, waveform change, but just a phase shift. And uh, yeah, for the, and then you can, of course, for the, here also demonstrate how to read that from max 3D and change that to uh, other, other, other formats using OpSpy. Like here, I'm doing a filtering, and then, then, uh, and then store these things uh, into the into the same file. So, uh, uh, so uh, initially, probably sure we, we always want to you know make this more convenient for the users. Like you can specify, okay, I want sync, I want something. But uh, uh, currently, for Apple 3 it's just either ask to output or let CDF output. And uh, and uh, and, uh, but I but I think it, if if you know how to use OpSpy and and this stuff, it's very easy to change to the to the format you really want. And about the US array, uh, we record the the as you remember, we record uh, three uh, uh, three responses, so including the displacement and the the bulk. Uh, the more uh, sorry the volume change and the rotation and so uh, because we have a quite quite a lot of stations for so here we can probably make uh, animation so these 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 uh, the, the following part shows how to finally reading this result and finally get get to something something like that so here what I'm visualizing is uh, like the, the 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 rotation the R three uh, the vertical rotation of the of the of the stations recorded by the by the by the USTA network. So that that's the that's the first example. Uh, this is a global scale simulation in one D and uh, and three D, and output is kind of like station wise output. So in the in the second example here. Uh, we are doing like uh, the the SEG sort problem. This is a benchmark problem actually from SEG. So Tari showed you the the model. Uh, like uh, we have a, like a, a, a sort a sort uh, a cavity or something in uh, in in rock. So the sort is very kind of uh, very soft. So it create a strong impedance contrast between the rock. And the sort. So for this one, we also have like a 1D uh, problem and a 3D problem. So for the 1D problem, we just simulate the wave in the background, in the background model without the sort and without perturbations. And for the 3D one, we, we do them. And this mesh is uh, this mesh is a partition mesh. So which means it's not D shaped, but it's like a box. Like it's like a 2D, like a piece of paper. The real demand will be like a cylinder, as you can, 
uh, C for access 3D, everything is kind of a rotation around access. So if we create a demand, partition demand like a, like a, like a, like a rectangle, and you rotate it around the axis, the final domain you get is a cylinder. So that's what we do. Uh, we simulate uh, in 3D. So uh, the models, uh, they are basically the same, but the difference is the mesh, you use a local mesh. And uh, for the 3D, I'm using a not very high Fourier coefficient. So the, because the sort is quite strong, so the result is probably not accurate enough. Uh, this is just to save some time, and uh, you you can so you can run this problem uh, in a few minutes for the three D simulation because it's local scale. It's the domain is much smaller than uh, than the global scale, and the the frequency is five hertz. Uh, so uh, the others is the same. Uh, the main difference here is uh, the the output. Here I don't have any station output. Okay, here I don't have any station output. I just uh, use two groups of uh, element out output. So the first output is the, what I call the orthogonal as, as modal slices. So these are the vertical slices. So uh, it's something I show you here now. So this is the first group I recorded. Uh, uh, if you see, so here I, the source is in the middle on the axis, the source is on the axis. And uh, I record four slices around the source, so they are orthogonal, okay. Uh, so as you can see here, there are lots of parameters to define where you want to record it. So uh, Axis 3D have a pretty strong uh, element output system. So you can record wave field uh, inside a volume, a 3D volume, or you can read you, or you can record it on a horizontal surface or vertical slices. So this group contains four slices. So there must be uh, some places where I specify the address five, here it is. So here I specify four, five, it's zero, half pi, pi, and uh, uh, 1.5 pi. So that's the four the slices I, I specified. And also you can choose how many geo points you want, right? So uh, maximally you can have 25. If you simulate the problem with five, five by five geo points, which means the polynomial order of four, uh, you can, you will have maximally have 25 points in one element. And here I'm using three of them. So the second group, I'm going to talk about is called the Fourier coefficients on the ocean floor, which basically the, the surface here. So what I'm recording here is a horizontal uh, surface, it's the ocean floor. So, but instead of, sorry, where I am. So instead of having a lots of stations on the surface, I can record the Fourier series over the surface so that after the simulation, you give any coordinates or latitude longitude, I can extract the, the, the displacement on that station. This is how we define, how we store the Fourier coefficients. Uh, again, you don't have to just record the, horror or, or the Fourier coefficients on the surface. You can record the Fourier, the Fourier series in the volume so that if you give a 3D code, if you give a, Three coordinates you can extract wave field from that, but of course the output will be very large. You can imagine it's three D wave field, so it will be quite large to, to 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 store them. Okay, that's how we define the wave field output. And then after these simulations, what we get, we will get two let's say they files, one containing wave field on these slices, and other one containing wave field on the surface. And then we, we provided here the IPython notebook to do uh, post-processing. So uh, again, I think it's something we could improve, right? Because uh, yeah, because access only record the wave field and uh, you sort of need to understand the, 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 the data structure in the output files to do post-processing. And uh, for this part, 
uh, the uh, you can understand them based on this. Uh, uh, you can you can open the new sorry you can open the nested file and see the structure, and also you can learn by this by this code. Again, it's uh, as I said, the code itself is quite comprehensive, but uh, uh, the documentation is kind of lagging behind because yeah because lack of development force. So this is how we do uh, with, the, with the ocean floor. Uh, this uh, a little bit post-processing codes. And what finally is when you specify the XY, because it's, this is the Cartesian problem in spherical grid the latitude and longitude. When you specify the XY, you can extract the wave grid from the surface database accessing through the uh, uh, recorded during the simulation. And the second, we also, rec uh, we also uh, recorded the wavefield on the four vertical slices. And uh, in this example, uh, we show how to rig them and then use them to create uh, animations uh, using a library called uh, PyVTK. So we change this wavefield into VDT files and uh, then we can visualize them in Paraview. And this is this is a result. So you can see that if I plot, maybe I can I can I can show you. You see the boundary of the rock. Uh, the rock is sorry. The sort is something here. It's 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 kind of not very clear because the, it's a very low frequency mesh and uh, no very low frequency simulation. But uh, even with this low frequency and very small uh, Fourier coefficients, you can see that the very not very clear. You can see the boundary of the of the of the. Oh, sorry, I should play it. Maybe it's clear. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that's that's basically the how the wave propagate in this complex three D model. You see the wave uh, cannot sort of the, there's a, there's a contrast here where the small energies can go into it. Can, cannot go into it, yeah. And then here now you can see the the shape of the of the of the salt body. Okay, and of course this is happening in in three D on the four app four slices. Stop it. So uh, I'm I think I'm pretty much on time. So what I'm uh, I. Uh, just in summary, uh, we have a, a, a repository, and uh, I'm uh, I'm maintaining it, but not as as, as frequently as as when my work is tired. But uh, still, uh, I'm I'm maintaining it uh, regularly, and uh, there's a wiki page where you can sort of learn the software, and the installation is update. So I help. Now, currently, the installation of the measure and the solver will be easy for you if you want to try. And uh, we provide, currently, we provide two complete examples where you can learn all the, mostly all the input parameters. And, uh, uh, and uh, we provide Jupyter notebooks uh, to do uh, post processing. And, and uh, uh, these two examples are complete. So if you follow the they, they contains their own, own readme here. So if you follow the readme here, you will be able to, uh, hopefully you will be <laughs> smoothly reproduce the results. Yeah, that's my demonstration. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kungo. Very impressive. Um, well, how difficult is it to, let's say to add, um, a 3D perturbation near the surface. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just if you know if you already know the, the, the like the coordinates and the it's 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 it, I, I would say it's it's rather easy. What what is more complex, you know, uh, Hila, it's uh, if you uh, you have to make mesh where you like let the discontinuity. Yeah be located on the mesh. So this is something yeah. I think many people uh, uh, are not aware of. 
for instance, in your case, for instance, if you want a 50 kilometer, like a, a from surface to 50 kilometers, right? And uh, in the prim model, there's no 50 kilometer on the discontinuity. So, and if you do things like that, it, then your model is kind of smoothed by the, by the, by the, by the, by the, by the elements. Then the, if you just add that naively, it's easy to do in S3D. But what, what the correct way is, when you use the Salvas mesh, you add a fictitious sort of like unrealistic discontinuity in the input of, uh, of uh, in, in the input file. So basically you add a, 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 a discontinuity, which is not real discontinuity in terms of velocity at 50 kilometers. Then so the Salvas measure will create an element boundary at that. Then you add your 3D file. Then that's yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe maybe in addition to that, um, we should mention that um, very lucky to have Kuang Dai for a few days of a hackathon um, in the next few weeks, where we hope to resolve a lot of the outstanding things that we've been sort of struggling with in the last few years almost. Um, and we'll consolidate all sorts of input from people that have been using the code, one of which is actually um, putting back in something that we've had before, which is very easy inclusion of, of like different shapes of heterogeneities, just in this chain of, of the, the model specification. Mm -hmm. You just say like you have already like a geometric and a volumetric model, and then on top of that, you can just superimpose another spherical blob or a slab or something like that. Yes, so, or just add perturbations. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, add the perturbation is just points. one aspect of that. Yeah, if yeah. that would be easy, you know, you know, I, like our molasses basin here, also, and this is something that I would like to understand. And I think, uh, you know, it's it's fantastic what you did, uh, Tai and Kunga, Kunga did all the work. It's really a, a fantastic tool for, let's say, global wave propagation. Of, of course, not many of us are are relate are you know working on global wave propagation, but but still, there's so many interesting problems to work on also in connection with, with what we're doing you know gradients uh, uh, that we observe uh, on all scales so yeah it would be cool to push uh, to use this and have a good uh, user community yeah yeah so uh, yeah if you if you if, if you uh, need like uh, like like at the beginning you want to uh, implement a model and I can probably yeah. help yeah okay. Yeah, I, I think technically, I think <laughs> this is probably my bad. So, uh, so technically, people uh, who prepare a model need to know how to uh, create and uh, manipulate a net city file. That's I think is something not yeah. good, maybe, yeah. <laughs> because people have to understand how a net city work, how you create the haters, and how you. Uh, but once you have one piece of code work, then it's yeah. probably, it's, it's quite, it should be quite easy. Just have a quick question for Quang Dai. Uh, yeah. I just tried to install uh, the Axis N 3D, but uh, on a Mac uh, operating system, but I don't think uh, the default C compiler on the Mac is uh, C++ 17 compatible. Did you have to install a, com a different compiler? Uh, no, actually, uh, I, 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 if you upgrade your, if you upgrade your development tool and Xcode to, uh, to the most recent one, it should be, uh, it should be C++ 17 compatible, even C++ 20, I think. So the, the C long, I think, uh, com I think comparatively the, the Intel is the slowest one and, and C long is the fastest one. So. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I, yeah, I did, um, um, I checked and I do have C long uh, currently, but uh, I got a bunch of errors when I tried to go through the installation. So I thought it might be a compiler issue. Yeah, yeah, it should be. A, yeah, if you get errors during the compiling stage, it's a compiler issue, means it doesn't support 17. Okay. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, you could try to upgrade the, the maybe. I think I, I'm using Mac as well. And my Ceylon works fine for Accent 3D. <laughs> which, uh, which, which, which upgrade or uh, version did you have? 
No, I, I just upgraded the Xcode. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, when I install S X Xcode, it, yeah, it just upgrade everything. Perfect. All right, I'll give that a try. Thanks. No problem. Other questions? I guess you can all tell that I'm really excited about this hackathon, but maybe maybe just a motivation. If anyone has you know any incentive to use this code, the next few weeks are really helpful. Like if if you have you know issues with installing or something like that, then by all means please feed that to us because this is the time where we can really move quickly with things or any requests for output or whatever model types or something like. Okay, that. so maybe we should get started with the problem I have in mind. <laughs> okay, any other questions to Kung Dai? Thanks very much, Kung Dai. You know, applause and for entire, of course, uh, excellent presentations. And uh, I, I'd say, you know, underrated with respect to SpecFem because it's uh, very powerful, it's, it's more efficient. You know, not to downplay SpecFem, it has also other capabilities, but um really sh we should we should yeah to try to bring it alive by using it for problems where it makes sense okay um any other questions to anything we had today any comments it was a long day lots of information um but of course the all the slides and everything will be available so you may want to go back to this and to digest it and you know you may over the next one two three years during your project may come back here and uh, maybe uh, find some of the information useful <laughs>